I'll introduce the panel from left to right, well, my left, and start with the two respondents who will be speaking a little bit later in the program. So we've got Linda Calabresi, and she is sitting beside uh, Irene Yuan Sun. And then we are going to be listening very shortly to the two key authors of the study uh, that we're discussing uh, today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Florian Schaffer. Uh, he's from the London School of Economics, but we're going to claim here at SOAS that we taught him everything that he knows, uh, of course, because he does his PhD here. And then a good colleague, uh, Dr. Carlos Oya, in the Department of Development Studies. So what we have here is a discussion to do with a very, very important issue in the study of Chinese and African relations. It's a field that all of you will be aware is full of accusations and very little analyzed data. So one of the key important elements of what we're going to be discussing this afternoon is the presence of serious investigation based on serious data concentrated in two countries, Ethiopia and Angola, which have multi-sectoral manufacturing and other enterprises. So you're looking at something which is variegated and complex. And looking at the whole question of Chinese firms and employment dynamics in Africa across a range of these variegated uh, factors is something which I don't think has actually been done before to the extent that our two authors have managed to do it. So it's pioneering work, groundbreaking work, very much detailed field work. Uh, which calls into question a lot of the assumptions that have been glibly made by people who are either alarmist or uncritically in favor of Chinese uh, activities in Africa. We're going to have a presentation about their findings, and then we're going to have two respondents who are very expert in things African and Chinese uh, responding to what the two authors have got to tell us. But I'm going to hand over to the authors now, and I think we start with Carlos. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for coming. Um, such a hot day, end of June, not easy to get big crowds. Um, so this is the um, last dissemination workshop for this four-year project. We have already presented uh, our findings, our main findings, in two other workshops in Luanda a few weeks ago and in Addis Ababa last week. So we already get a feel of the reactions and uh, comments on, on our findings. Uh, but before I, I, we start, we kick off with the presentation, I just wanted to say a few words um, um, just to make sure people understand that a project like this cannot be run by two people. Um, um, it, is, it has been a very complex, challenging project in many ways, and it has um, involved uh, quite a number of people, you know, doing all sorts of different things. And each of these individuals have contributed to what we achieved. I think it's... You know, four years ago, uh, not many uh, people we talked to uh, gave us much hope in terms of trying to achieve what we did. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to just give you a few minutes of acknowledgments to, to key individuals. I mean, first of all, obviously, we want to acknowledge the funding from ESRC um, and the DFIC Economic Growth Research Program, uh, which um, gave the resources that are necessary for this kind of project, and particularly also to ODI, uh, has been very supportive from the very start in, in many different ways. Um, also to our advisory group, we have peer reviewers who've been supporting us over the years and giving us feedback. Uh, three uh, individuals, Ching Kwan Lee, um, Lucy Corking, and Pedro Martins, who is now at the uh, World Bank. But, I mean, this wouldn't be possible without uh, a big team. Uh, I'm just going to give you a flavor of who was involved. And, I mean, the main, main individual, I cannot name everyone, but I'll try to be as far as possible. Obviously, I mean, Florian is my comrade in arms, you know, involved in this from the very, very start. And he's managed to put up with my demanding micromanagement uh, for too often. Um, but we've managed to survive, both of us, you know, without fighting too much. Um, Christina Wolf, uh, she is not here, unfortunately, but she was uh, an important catalyst in the early stages of the, of the project, and she contributed a lot to our desk reviews. 
And there were a number of other colleagues uh, at SOAS, like Terry McKinley, who's in the room, Tim Pringle, Dick Lowe, who also contributed to the, uh, to the research in different ways. Um, <clears throat> certainly, this wouldn't be possible with our local partners in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Economics Association, and in Angola, the uh, Facultad de Economia uh, of Universidad de Costa Neto, and also Renmin University of Beijing, which uh, uh, cooperated in, in various ways. From FECUAN, we're lucky to have Fernandez Wanda, who's sitting there at the back, who's also a PhD student at SOAS now, and, 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 and he's, uh, he was a major game changer for you know, what happened in Angola. And um, important qualitative research provided by Xia Yong Tang, who is very well known in the field, and uh, also very humorous and you know, fun person to work with. Now, um, obviously, this kind of project with the sorts of you know, large-scale surveys that uh, we are going to be reporting on wouldn't be possible with very, very strong field teams. I always say that. I mean, I've been doing this for a number of years in Africa, conducting labor surveys. Um, and the field teams are critical. If you don't have a strong, committed, determined field team, there's no chance of success. Uh, we had teams of eight people in each country with two supervisors within those teams, and they did an unbelievably fantastic job. Um, it was difficult. It was very challenging because of the obvious problems with access that you would imagine. Uh, in that effort, there were some people who particularly helped in the early stages of the process, like Elena Perez Nino, but especially I would like to single out uh, Borja Monreal, who's sitting here. You know, he came to uh, see what uh, we actually found. Um, and he was, um, he was unbelievably useful, especially in those early, very difficult stages of getting the teams used to the demands of, the, of this kind of field work. And I don't want to end without mentioning the most important person in this project. Uh, this is Wei Wei Chen. Uh, she's been there from the very, very start of the project. Uh, she did her first Africa trip uh, at the beginning of that project, and it wasn't the last, fortunately. And she got basically hooked up with these topics, and uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't stop going. Um, so she's been involved in, across all stages of the project, and I don't think what we did would have been possible without her role. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, for acknowledgments. I think, you know, there are other people, obviously, but, um, and I would like to mention our field team uh, individuals one by one, but all the names are in the reports that you can download. And we're going to crack on with the actual uh, content. So, <clears throat> we're going to give you a little bit of context uh, about China's engagement in Africa, and particularly where the, in what ways China's context matters to understand some of these issues. Uh, I need to give you some background about the actual project, so I will say something about the research process and the research design, because I think that is what uh, uh, sets, our, sets this project apart in many ways. And then we're going to uh, go straight to some of the main findings. Of course, we cannot cover everything. This was a four-year uh, um, uh, period of research, quite intensive field-based research. Um, so we're going to focus on some of the main findings around job creation and the localization rates, i.e. workforce localization, which is one of the big questions in this field. Uh, we say something about labor force characteristics. That's what, that was one of our research questions, as I'll mention later. And probably the topic that most people are waiting for is wages, working conditions, and industrial relations in these uh, work sites. And then we end up with some basic uh, conclusions. Um, just to say that we have already quite a bit of material uh, online in our uh, project website, which is, you know, the SOAS website plus IDCEA. And uh, you will find some background material and working papers, but also some of the emerging reports. Uh, we are still writing up, and indeed we will have a synthesis report fairly soon, which will incorporate some of the feedback that we're going to get in this workshop, as well as the previous workshop, and from our discussions. And then, you know, obviously we will continue writing up until I don't know when. Um, now, uh, on China's engagement in Africa, there's a number of issues that we need to bear in mind. Um, first of all, um, part of our, our objective was to look into in what ways uh, different Chinese actors have contributed or are catalysts of processes of structural transformation in Africa. And this is an issue that has been revived now. Uh, um, for the past 40 years, the, the word structural change 
uh, has barely been mentioned, and for the first time you really get people talking about structural change and industrialization in some African context. And it's quite clear that the example of China has been uh, um, significant, particularly for the aspirations of those African policymakers that see uh, China and other uh, East Asian economies as examples of success in a neoliberal world. Um, so China did grow as, as, uh, to become uh, the world's manufacturing hub, and still, despite uh, uh, changes in the structure of the Chinese economy, this is still the case. But we are moving into a new scenario that is uh, um, labeled as the new normal, um, which also implies a different kind of structural change in the Chinese economy, moving towards uh, a process of economic growth and economic dynamism that is led by innovation and internal demand rather than exports. Uh, so that obviously has some implications uh, for the global uh, stage. Uh, certainly what is happening in the Chinese labor market matters as well. Uh, for those sectors that are likely to become obsolete for all sorts of reasons. And uh, a big question nowadays, and those who are working on labor issues in, in China, is, is the paradox or the, or the evidence of wage growth, very rapid wage growth, even you know, faster than productivity growth, particularly in the last 10, 15, 15 years. Clearly, these labor market dynamics in China are having important effects on certain sectors, particularly you know, light manufacturing would be one of them. And that has led some uh, uh, well-known commentators like Justin Lin to say that where well, there are 80 million jobs up for grabs in the next, uh, in the near future, jobs that will uh, go out uh, from China. They might go to robots, of course, but they might also go to uh, actual people somewhere else in, in the world. So part of that process has to do, therefore, with uh, this notion of uh, go out uh, the Go Out strategy, which was you know, formalized in 2002 and has been uh, um, taking speed, especially in the last 10 years. And one of the aspects of this Go Out strategy is the globalization of Chinese firms. Uh, Chinese firms, state-owned enterprises, as well as private firms uh, going global and searching new markets. And certainly Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is one of those destinations. I think there is, uh, uh, there is an exaggeration sometimes when people focus too much on Africa, and actually many of these firms are operating in uh, several other regions, and particularly Asia is still you know, the primary uh, recipient of, of FDI. Now, this is a picture of uh, the pattern of wage growth. As you can see, quite substantial shift, especially from the early 2000s, uh, which have to do with all sorts of uh, uh, issues. We don't have time to go into the detail. But clearly, this is affecting uh, especially those sectors in China that have been operating on the basis of uh, low wages, or low wages as, 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 as a market of competitiveness. So wage growth is, is gaining pace. Uh, um, of course, productivity is still very, very high. So unit labor, labor costs in certain sectors are still fairly competitive on a global scale. But this is clearly changing the game. Now, when we talk about Chinese engagement in Africa, one needs to, and I think the literature now has uh, moved on, you know, from sort of early myths. Uh, but we do know now that uh, there are multiple vectors from trade. Trade clearly is one of the key vectors in this growing relationship between China and African countries. Investment, official finance is particularly important to understand the contribution of Chinese institutions to uh, the aspirations of structural change in many African countries. Construction services, which is uh, one of the targets of our research, and of course, aid, cooperation, and migration. When we look at Chinese firms uh, and who are they, there are different players there, and our main focus is on two sets of players which have um, uh, been or had had an impact, significant impact on some countries much more than others, of course. Infrastructure contractors, a lot of official finance from China is actually going to economic infrastructure, a very large proportion of it, especially power generation and transport and communication, but also you have these emerging phenomena, the still early days, of private manufacturing firms uh, moving in, in, in groups, in, in, in fact, to particular destinations. Of course, not many countries have uh, succeeded in attracting these and other firms, and one of our target countries, Ethiopia, is a good, very good example of that, and that's why we also focus on that. But they are not the only ones. There's also mining corporations, both private and state-owned, and some of the Best research that has been done in recent years, especially Lee's work on Zambia, is precisely about construction and, and mining. Uh, 
And of course, not forget trade and services, uh, which you know, can be found almost anywhere in the African continent. As I say, finance was an important vector in this process, and we, this is the sort of most reliable data we have. This is just for loans. Uh, you can see the uh, pace of growth um, slowing down, and, and, and it's this kind of dynamics which has uh, given rise to uh, a number of heated debates nowadays on, on whether this is causing some kind of debt distress. So there's a lot of comment and debate now nowadays on and the extent to which African countries are falling into a new debt trap as a result of, of that. And of course, we can leave that debate for the moment out of this uh, uh, panel. On FDI and what we call construction overseas projects, again, we, have, we see the same dynamics of very fast growth. Um, what is interesting about this is very often we tend to pay, pay, pay attention to FDI. Uh, we're thinking about investment, but actually in quantitative terms, uh, the size and the contract revenues of construction projects are far more significant. So, um, and this is, this is a sector that is primarily dominated by state-owned enterprises. So Chinese state-owned enterprises have become global competitors in infrastructure construction, partly because of the huge market they've enjoyed in China for many, many years, and now they are uh, pushed to, to globalize, and they have all the, obviously, technical capacities to, to implement all sorts of demanding projects. So, Africa is becoming, indeed, or has become an important market for some of these companies. And indeed, some of the available evidence would suggest that it's not only important for them, but especially for the Africa market. Uh, nowadays, um, it is estimated that between 40 and 50 percent of this infrastructure construction market is um, accounted for by these um, Chinese enterprises, as I say, most of which are state-owned enterprises. And the, the, the sort of dynamics of the trend is towards, you know, continuous growth, partly because the competitors, mainly from Europe, Latin America, um, are not able, particularly in certain African markets, to uh, offer the same technical and financial conditions that most Chinese firms tend to offer. So what is happening now, for example, just going back to this, is that some people might be tempted to think that uh, this is essentially on the back of Chinese finance, actually not true. The proportion of uh, contracts won by Chinese firms that is financed by other non-Chinese sources of finance keeps growing and growing. In other words, that more and more Chinese firms are winning bids uh, um, from projects financed by the European Union, the World Bank, and, and so on. Um, these dynamics do have employment effects. Okay, so you know, we, we're done with the sort of background and the context. Let's go to to our main, main target. Um, they create jobs, at least this is what some people would hope, and there are questions about the nature of these jobs and how they differ from the labor market conditions that we find in this uh, context. When you look at the literature on employment effects, on employment issues uh, um, associated with Chinese firms in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have three fairly widespread perceptions, particularly in the early days. If you read the literature from the early 2000s and, and then much of the media reporting, you get the uh, perception that Chinese firms mostly rely on Chinese expatriate labor, particularly in construction projects. And this has been a leitmotif for many, many years. In other terms, that localization rates were really, really low. The second type of perception was the working conditions are poor in absolute terms, not, not just relatively to other uh, companies. And also that as a result of, of those two, that Chinese firms barely contribute or you know, make a very limited contribution to skill development in these emerging sectors. Of course, this, these are widespread perceptions, particularly still in the media. And when you get questions on these issues, these, these perceptions keep coming back. Despite the fact, I mean, we are not the only ones to do some, you know, uh, uh, slightly more uh, um, um, long-term research. I mean, again, I mentioned Ching Kwan Lee's work on, on Zambia. And uh, when you read that kind of work, you know, people should be already revising some of those perceptions or indeed the work that uh, McKinsey did a few years ago in the service of firms that they, they did, which, you know, uh, debunked some of, these, some of these myths. However, when we interrogate the evidence that we find on, some, on these issues, both 
from research that has been conducted, uh, but also from media reporting, uh, we find uh, some uh, disturbing facts. First of all is uh, the excessive reliance on media reports and all sorts of, all sorts of anecdotal evidence coming from different sources. Secondly, a problem that is actually quite common to many African countries is the sheer fra fragmentation of official statistics. Generally, official statistics on labor are extremely weak in most African countries, and that obviously uh, creates problems for those who want to assess uh, the extent to which condi working conditions are good, bad, or what. Um, labor market statistics are either absent or not very reliable, or they only cover a very, very small segment of the labor force. Um, third, there is a lack of large-scale quantitative surveys of workers. There is quite a lot of research based on interviews with managers, but of course, you know, interviewing managers and asking managers about working conditions is always going to be slightly problematic. Uh, but we didn't really find enough uh, uh, substantial evidence coming from the reports that workers provide on their conditions. Um, uh, quite apart uh, from the fact that there are not enough surveys of this kind, and indeed, actually, many African countries lack labor force surveys, uh, which uh, creates problems when we try to compare with average conditions. So in most cases, there's no, it's, no, it's not possible to actually compare to an average condition. If I'm asking, what is the average wage in the manufacturing sector in Ethiopia? The answer is we don't know. Okay? Simply, there's no data about that. But Part of the problem with a lot of these narratives is the lack of comparative analysis. So much emphasis and focus has been on Chinese firms that you know, we've sort of forgotten that there are other firms in those markets, in those sectors, which are also operating or been operating for some time. They also employ people, and they also uh, require some sort of uh, probing and, and, and investigation. And generally, uh, we see that in much of the literature, with some notable exceptions, of course, uh, there is uh, an oversimplification of labor relations and labor markets, you know, more generally in, in understanding things in, in very binary terms. There's excessive uh, reliance on binaries. So given that uh, these problems with the evidence, then we, we tried to create something that was obviously challenging from the start, but which could overcome some of these uh, uh, substantial weaknesses. So what did we do? We, we tried to first... Uh, focus on questions that we could try to answer. Of course, not all these questions were easy to answer. So we look at, uh, we focus on national workers, African workers, Ethiopian and Angolan workers in this case. We try to look at, you know, what are the employment effects of these and other firms in these particular sectors? And what can we say about the comparative working conditions? We look at, you know, what kinds of labor regimes predominate in different uh, sectors, in different companies. Uh, can we say something about Chinese firms really being substantially different from the rest, and if they are different, in what ways and why. Um, one of the reasons why we chose to do this analysis in two countries was because our hypothesis was that country context matters a lot. And we chose two countries that, for all sorts of reasons, are quite different, but also share some few similarities. So we tried to look at in what ways the conditions in these countries do shape the way firms uh, uh, configure the labor regimes and the way they recruit labor and the way they treat the workers. And last but not least, we're also interested beyond these comparisons between firms. We want to know something about who, these, who are these workers. There isn't much research done on construction and manufacturing workers in Africa. Very, very little. There's quite a bit on agricultural workers, but not, I mean, even on that, is, there's not a lot. Um, but we wanted to know, you know, what are the emerging, what are the profiles of these people? You know, how young they are, the women, men, what kinds of skills they bring, how, how differentiated they are as well, because there's always a tendency towards uh, uh, homogenizing these different categories of workers. So in order to make sense of all these uh, questions and variations, we um, have worked with an analytical framework that tries to combine three basic levels of analysis. Um, this is what we call you know, re labor regime co configuration framework. Um, similar variations of these have been used by other researchers, uh, some of whom have been also SOAS researchers, by the way. Um, and we try to look at first, you know, what, is, what are the characteristics of the national political economy, i.e. the macro context, that are important to bear in mind when thinking about what we observe at the micro level. So overall, the balance of class forces in any given context, and 
more broadly the politics of production that one finds, which includes also an understanding of things like the relative weakness of the trade union uh, movement in these countries or you know, any trends and patterns of, for example, informalization or weakening of the bargaining power of workers in this, in this context. The second level is the sector value chain characteristics. This is important, especially when you're working with different kinds of sectors. Construction and manufacturing are very, very different. So in each of these, you will find different types of labor regime configurations. But also, even when you look at the manufacturing sector, you're going to see quite a lot of variation, both within countries, but also between countries. And the contrast between Angola and Ethiopia was, was particularly uh, um, productive in the sense that and, and Ethiopia has uh, manufacturing firms which are incorporated in global production networks and therefore subject to the pressures that one finds in some of these global production networks, particularly in textile and garments, whereas that is not the case in Angola, where you know, our target was the building materials uh, uh, manufacturing sector, which grew on the back of a very fast reconstruction program and infrastructure rehabilitation. And the third level is the workplace dynamics, the firm level. So the raw, basically, we're looking here at the raw encounters between employers, managers, and workers, labor process organization, and wage bargaining you know, over productivity concerns and, and so on. So our take on this is that it is only through a combination of these different levels of analysis that we can actually understand the many sources of variation in working conditions, and that uh, only focusing on one or two of these aspects is not uh, uh, um, is not suitable to really understanding the uh, outcomes, labor outcomes that we observe. So how did we re design this research? Definition would be that this is a multi-stage mixed methods uh, program with large and quantitative surveys, OK? What this means is that a primary source of the evidence are these large quantitative surveys. However, this is complemented in many different ways through various different types of integration with careful qualitative research conducted at different stages of the research process. So the stages were between late 2015 to late 2018, so three years of fieldwork. Started with literature reviews, database searches globally, but also in particular to uh, referring to the cases of Ethiopia and Angola. Extensive qualitative and quantitative scoping research that took several months. One of the aims of this phase was precisely to gain a, to actually prepare the ground for the large scale service. You can't really do these kinds of surveys unless you prepare the conditions on the ground. You can't show up to interview workers in construction sites and factories that easily. Uh, once that scoping phase was completed, we managed, therefore, to uh, implement this large end sample service of African workers in Angola. In Ethiopia, different stages, but of course, you know, when you have these longer-term projects, we also hit by the circumstances of the time in each context. So in, in Angola, we were affected by the crisis, which followed the, oil, the, the, the drop in the oil price, which you know, had a massive impact on the construction sector at the time we were doing the survey. So that also affected the timing. And in Ethiopia, we were affected by the state of emergency, which was declared in in October 2016, which basically prevented any serious fieldwork for a number of months. Uh, so that is the reality of you know, these kinds of projects and fieldwork when you, when you try to do the surveys. Then this was followed by firm survey, survey and interviews with company managers, and finally, in-depth follow-up qualitative research, which included some tracking work, phone services to track uh, attrition rates for workers, you know, what sort of changes in wages we had observed in the, in the last 18 months. This was at the end of 2018 and also a number of life histories to understand more uh, in depth uh, the profiles of some of these workers. As I said before, one of the problems with the current evidence is that there is no real comparative analysis. So following our analytical framework, we looked at three layers of comparisons. Of course, for the national context, the country context, we chose Angola and Ethiopia. Angola and Ethiopia are two uh, very, very good examples of Chinese engagement in Africa for all sorts of reasons, but certainly in, in quantitative terms, these are two of the main uh, destinations of both uh, FDI but also construction services. In terms of sectors, we try to homogenize as much as possible. So for the uh, construction sector, of course, there was no point in doing all sorts of kinds of construction, no point in doing, in doing real estate developments. If you want to reduce the number of variables and confounding factors, you need to be as specific as possible on the sector. So we chose road building uh, 
primarily because this was one of the areas of public works which had a higher volume of, uh, of, uh, of funding and, and infrastructure development, but also because this was an area where you could find a good sample of Chinese, other foreign, and uh, um, local or national companies. In uh, relation to the manufacturing sector, of course, there was not much choice, uh, much more choice in Ethiopia than, than in Angola, uh, but we chose the sectors that were particularly most relevant for this study, given the size and the employment generated of the previous years. And in order to basically address the big questions that have uh, uh, been occupying people around employment conditions and Chinese firms in Africa, we had to uh, uh, divide our samples into uh, different groups of Angolan or Ethiopian or the foreign and Chinese companies in as systematically as possible for each of these subsectors. Okay. So we have this evidence for each of those subsectors which sam with samples that are actually fairly representative of the leading companies in each of these sectors. So that was the sampling process. So the first step was the selection of firms. You know, when you get, I mean, this, this is important for a simple reason. Whenever you present, you know, these kinds of findings, there's always going to be people who don't like them, okay? And so we always have to defend, you know, what we did. Um, and one of the things that often uh, um, are thrown at researchers is, oh, your sampling is rubbish, or you didn't have enough people, or whatever. So we have to be very clear about what we sample and why. There was no point in having a sort of random, you know, representative sample of the whole sector, because these sectors are highly heterogeneous. And what we want is to really compare like with like. So what we did is, was to choose the top leading firms within each sector. So of course, this means that we are, you know, setting the bar high because we are comparing those Chinese firms to the most established and leading firms within each sector, both you know, national firms, but also uh, a, a global or international firms. So in the case of, let's say, Angola, that would mean that in the construction sector, you have some of the you know, biggest contractors, global contractors that operate in the Angolan market. So in fact, our sample actually included all the main players in these sectors, okay? Um, which has implications. So basically, you know, for, uh, the sake of clarity, we are not comparing these conditions to any average. This is not the average. This is top benchmark. What you would expect that the conditions in these companies are actually better than uh, the average for all sorts of reasons. Within each firm, so once we selected the firms and we were lucky enough to basically pretty much include all the target firms we had in our, in our initial sampling frames. We had very, very few examples of uh, rejections. Um, so within each firm, we, uh, again, in order to avoid excess heterogeneity, we just focused on those categories of workers who've received, who've got jobs in these sectors. Uh, from our scoping phase, it was quite clear that 80% of more of the jobs created for Angolan and Ethiopian workers were in the unskilled or low-skilled and semi-skilled categories, okay? Semi-skilled categories meaning jobs like, you know, a machine operator, okay, in a road, in a road project. Um, or, you know, sort of slightly more qualified machine operators in factories. Within those strata of workers, we then randomly selected uh, workers who were uh, present at the work site or at the workplace at the time of the survey. Of course, we tried to time those surveys at a time where we could maximize the number of workers in place. Okay? So that way we also tried to be as independent as possible in terms of our sampling frames i.e. not really s simply asking companies for lists of workers, which could be biased, but also trying to probe this by finding everyone who was present at work at the time so that we could also capture some temporary workers, not simply permanent workers. You can imagine, actually, this, this is quite difficult. When you go to, even when you have, where you're given access to work, especially in factories, uh, uh, managers don't like random sampling, okay? For also, so not necessarily because they think that you know, that might be bad for the company, but also because if you go to a factory, how, this, that, how disruptive that can be in the production process. So it is also a question of how they expect the survey to be disrupted. So all this had to be negotiated. But at least I can guarantee you that there was no one single case without a random selection of workers within each of these straight. So this is the sample. So we have amalgamated all so that you get a, a sense of the size, the scale of the surveys. Uh, in terms of companies, total number of companies was 76. 
40 in the case of um, Ethiopia. And in terms of numbers of workers, over 1,500, the uh, biggest sample was in Ethiopia with 837 and 682 in the case of Angola. So these are fairly large samples, and we're confident that within the target sectors, they're fairly representative of the realities of these sectors. Um, and this was complemented by over 260 qualitative interviews in both countries combined. This was interviews with government officials, with company managers, with trade union leaders, and, and at different levels, uh, of course, and then also uh, other key informants. What kinds of firms did we find? So as I said before, these were uh, all the leading biggest employers within these target subsectors, leading Chinese, leading all the foreign, leading national. Uh, in the context of construction, road building, mostly central and provincial state-owned enterprises. Some of the you know, best known names in the Chinese, Chinese construction market, um, in both Angola and Ethiopia. In manufacturing, basically only private firms, in the case of Chinese firms, but also in the, other, in the other cases. And there were actually an interesting number of what we call translocal firms, particularly in Angola, in the building material sector, which is slightly smaller, meaning that this is not, strictly speaking, foreign direct investment. These are individuals with no business in China or elsewhere. Actually, there were a few cases of Portuguese investors who only have a business in uh, Angola. Okay? And therefore, they register the business as an Angolan business. So that's why we call, we call them translocal. Uh, this is a term that actually has been used in in the literature. And then other firms usually were part of transnational corporations, except for these translocal firms, particularly in the case of Angola, where you basically found, especially in the construction sector, quasi-European labor standards in terms of you know, the contractual arrangements, the conditions, and so on. In most cases, both in Angola and Ethiopia, one big difference between Chinese firms and the rest is that clearly Chinese firms have less experience and time in that market. So there were new players in most cases. Uh, we have data on the number of, uh, the average number of years in, in the market, and I think in Angola it was around 10 or 12 years in contrast with you know, over 20 for other companies. So this is some of the work sites, the workplaces that we were basically visiting, you know, road construction projects in Angola, uh, building materials factories, again in Angola, textile and garment factories uh, in Ethiopia, so as you can see, actually, when even visually, there are quite different types of uh, workplaces, and the labor relations are likely to be different. And this is just a basic illustration of our fieldwork. So this is an interview, okay, on the, on the road on the road project site. So this is conditions under which these interviews had to be done, and we have people like Borja, you know, sitting there in the, in the rain, and then. Up there is our, our friend Martin Jibota, one of our supervisors. So we're not lying when we say that a random sampling was being done. This is what he was doing. He was getting, putting the list of all the workers that had listed uh, in the previous census, and then he was generated random numbers for the different categories of workers on site so that we could do the interview straight away that day or the day after. Obviously, you must uh, imagine that you know, this couldn't be done over a uh, uh, sort of relaxed period of a few days companies would tell you, you want to do the salary, fine, you know, just get it done in one day or two days maximum, okay? Um, so it was very, as I say, very, very challenging for our um, researchers on the ground. Now the findings. Okay, enough of background. But I have to say because, you know, it's been four years, okay? <laughs> so if I don't say it now, I don't know when. Um, job creation and localization rate. I mean, I think the, main, the key research question is these localization rates because this is what has attracted all the imagination of people. You know, these guys just employing Chinese labor, actually, not just Chinese labor, prison labor. You know, that's the, one of the myths that have been circulating for many, many years. Ludicrous, but still, you know, some people buy. So the common narrative is this, many Chinese firms, especially in construction, they create limited local employment. And to an extent, this was propelled essentially by media reporting, but also by, uh, uh, very few, you know, two or three studies, um, which, um, um, you know, based on extremely small samples, they, uh, they, they just rolled out this narrative and as a snowball, you know, continuously was, was recycled. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. One is, okay, look at the official statistics. Are there any official statistics that can tell us something about what's going on? 
So you could get statistics on Chinese workers, okay, that are registered. Of course, you would imagine that these are likely to be underestimations of the real size of these groups. But this is what we get, and this is work that has been done by the China Africa Research Institute. By the way, a very good source of data on these issues, not on employment issues, generally on China Africa issues. Uh, what you can see there is an interesting uh, thing. First, first of all, yes, you know, 200,000. This is in the whole of Africa, not just Southern Africa. 200, less than 200,000 and so on, but no clear trend, and certainly from 2013-14, a downward trend. So declining the absolute number of record registered Chinese workers. Usually, these people are recorded because they are part of the registers of the companies that provide these construction services. So it's not really made up, of course, but they might miss out on other flows of migrants and, and Chinese workers which might be, who might be in other sectors. However, you must note that when you look at this data, there's huge concentration. So actually, few countries account for a very large proportion of these numbers. So let's you know, take in 2017, Algeria alone accounted for 30% of these total figures. Actually, the number of Chinese workers nowadays in the whole of Southern Africa is much less than you know, what m many people uh, uh, assume. But of course, this is not enough to say anything about localization rates. So we don't know really much about you know, how many jobs have been created overall. So we did a desk review. We tried to do an exhaustive search of all the various case studies. We tried to obviously not media reporting, but actual studies that tried to count you know, how many jobs for locals, how many jobs for Chinese, and so on. Uh, look at also some similar type of desk review which has been done by other researchers like uh, Jan Hyrong and Barry Sotman. And what we got was uh, a database with a weighted average of 85% African workers in the total uh, workforce. Most of the evidence was really in the range of 65 to 99%. So there is actually quite a lot of variation. And you do find some basket cases of individual construction projects where localization rates might be even lower than 50%. I think one of the countries where you can find this is uh, Guinea Equatorial. I'm not sure Borja is not surprised. Right? Um, so that means that there is variation. So you have some basket cases, say uh, Algeria, Angola, and Guinea Equatorial, where localization rates are expected to be very, very low, lower. And much better cases, Ethiopia, Ghana, would be examples of that. Also, what this, this review showed is that a lot depends on the sector. So manufacturing sector, you're likely to have much higher localization rates. Okay? Also, the type of skills needed and the experience of each firm in each country market. That is the other stylized fact that comes out of this next review is that the longer the companies stay in that country, obviously, the uh, faster the pace uh, of growth in localization rate. So one thing is looking at this data now, a very different looking at this data 10 years ago. So there is a clear trend towards greater uh, localization. So what did we find in our own survey? We did our own survey for, uh, across firms. Localization rates were, uh, in Angola were lower than the Southern African average. But even for Angolan standards, actually a lot of people in Angola were surprised that these rates were actually quite high. Of course, they are lower than other comparators, other, compar other companies. But when you look at the differences and you, and you know we, what other companies we're talking about, these are actually not huge. And in fact, what really comes out of this is other companies also employ expat labor. So if you take, for example, the case of Angola, it was really hard to find, especially in the construction sector, any company that had, you know, to middle to high level, any Angolan uh, management workers or even uh, engineers and some skilled labor. Um, so these, you know, non-Chinese non -Chinese firms. But clearly, you know, there is a difference there. But as they say, Angola is the basket case. What we found in Ethiopia is that on average, 90% of localization rates across firms, there was actually less variation there, okay? And almost all low-skilled and semi-skilled workers were basically Ethiopian, okay? So that also shows you that there is something about the country context that matters. Why is that? Because actually the sample in Angola and the sample in Ethiopia included some of the same firms. So basically we had one firm that had operations in both countries. And localization rates were different across these two countries. Same company. Okay? One reason, of course, we could go on, but one of the reasons is much uh, stricter application of visa regulations in the context of Ethiopia. So the Ethiopian government would be far more stringent in terms of giving work permits uh, 
to uh, Chinese workers for certain types of occupations. Of course, you can you know, cheat the system in different ways, but in Ethiopia, clearly, this didn't succeed. Uh, whereas in Angola, there was always a sort of generally a fairly lesser attitude you know, towards these things. So if projects really needed workers in order to complete projects on time, being under a lot of pressure, then that, that would be uh, done. So uh, this, is, this was actually from Angola. You know, uh, some years ago, you wouldn't expect an Angolan worker sitting in one of these uh, machines, uh, even you know, uh, driving trucks, for example. So things are also changing there. Nonetheless, for example, in Ethiopia, we did find that a very common complaint across all firms, not just Chinese, was that the, it was actually quite difficult to replace expat labor in management positions, especially sort of middle level into higher level, even factory floor supervision. Uh, although uh, they, you know, most of the companies, again, for the same kinds of restrictions, they had to uh, employ Ethiopian workers in this, in this, uh, at these levels. So there were issues around the lack of experience, the lack of practical experience, and in what, to what extent uh, uh, national systems of you know, vocational training and so on, or uh, 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 higher education uh, were good enough to provide the labor force that these, especially global competitors, suppliers incorporated in global value chains, actually needed for their production uh, processes. So that is something that is actually something we're going to perhaps be looking into in the next phase of, of our research, looking at you know, these constraints on employing management lab labor. So this is some of the data on actual real you know, jobs created just for manufacturing jobs in the Ethiopian context, how actually Chinese firms, in absolute terms, contributed quite a lot. So they were the leading uh, creators of jobs in Ethiopia compared to other foreign firms. This is from different sources, including the Ethiopian Investment Commission. But also in public works in Angola, you do find an interesting profile, especially in the times of the crisis, 2016-17, uh, the largest proportion of new jobs, of course this is new contracts generated, were in Chinese firms, uh, which also reflects the fact that a lot of the other firms in the sector were pretty much operating at, uh, uh, at a very low intensity and not really employing uh, new workers. So what can we say about the workers that we found? What are the main characteristics and can we find some patterns uh, across different types of firms and sectors? We did find some interesting patterns and some you know, key dis differences between Chinese firms and others particularly in Angola. So we can say that Angola, in Angola, Chinese firms were actually operating with a distinct, different type of labor force. Younger migrants from poorer provinces of Angola, more likely to be from rural settings and housed by companies in dormitories, much less educated than the others, with much less work experience. In fact, a lot of large proportion of the workers we found in Chinese firms had zero relevant experience in those sectors both in construction and manufacturing, and generally poorer. You know, we did run, you know, we use some socioeconomic basic asset indices, and we found some very, very significant differences between these different uh, groups of workers. On the other hand, all the foreign and Angolan firms tended to operate with a far more formal type of labor force, with more experience, longer job tenure in those jobs, residents near the workplaces, paying rent or owning property, and therefore the living costs, particularly for those who were based in Luanda, the living costs were higher, and the reservation wage was also much higher. Okay, so that also is important to note Then, when we come back to the issue of wages, this is an important determinant of the wages. So you see here the difference when we uh, looked at uh, dormitory labor regimes in the manufacturing sector in Angola. Very large proportion of workers, you know, nearly 70% of them basically living in dormitories. Okay, this is particularly important for those who are based in Luanda. Okay, Luanda is an extremely expensive city. And for all the foreign and Angolan companies, the use of dormitories is uh, much less uh, significant. In Ethiopia, we, we also found some um, um, results in terms of segmentation. Um, generally, we found that Chinese and other four foreign manufacturing firms, particularly those integrated in these global production networks, tended to employ mostly young women with relatively high levels of education for Ethiopian standards, in, 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 in particular, even in those sectors. Whereas workers in Ethiopian manufacturing firms, again, same sectors, leading firms, etc., were significantly older and also less educated, I mean, less, less of schooling. In the construction sectors, low-skilled workers 
have very, very little education. So actually, there's a big, big difference between some of the new, newly employed workers in this industrial part in Ethiopia and the profiles that you find in the construction sector. Whereas the semi-skilled labor force is a labor force with a lot of experience. And in fact, you know, very much sought after by these companies, these con construction companies, because their skills are uh, uh, not very common. So here's some data. So you can see in relation to age, very, very statistically, very significant differences between Ethiopian and the rest. So Chinese and other foreign are actually not that different. And of course, this is also reflected in quite different uh, proportions of those who have never, who are single, never married. And also you have uh, 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 evidence on um, gender-based market, labor market segmentation, how particular segments of these sectors are very, very female uh, dominated uh, in the workforce. What you also find, uh, both in Angola and Ethiopia, is very high rates of migration. Most of these workers across sectors are migrants, internal migrants. And they've been migrating, actually, for extended period of, periods of time. But this is particularly the case for all workers in manufacturing in Ethiopia and semi-skilled workers in the construction sector. Uh, you see that the low-skilled workers in the construction sector typically would be hired locally. You know, these were road construction uh, projects, and therefore them, a lot of these hiring happened at a local level. Um, so, obviously, this evidence on labor market segmentation is crucial to understand some of the differences that we find in working with conditions and wages. So we're not really talking about exactly the same labor forces. I mean, this couldn't happen by design. This is something we, need to, we had to, found, to find on the ground. So let me summarize some of the main you know, uh, uh, picture, the, the picture that we got. So what we find is that for some categories of workers, we do find that wages are slightly lower in Chinese firms, you know, 18, sorry, 8, 12%, or 15%, or depending on 20% uh, sometimes. But for other categories, we find no statistically significant differences. So there is quite a substantial variation there that needs to be explained. Um, and of course, these are just basic comparisons. We're not taking anything into account. And then we will come back to this point later on. When we look at non-wage working conditions, including uh, a range of fringe benefits, like social security, paid sick leave, health assistance, these tend to be better in non-Chinese firms. Again, these will uh, be partly related to the different labor forces that we mentioned before. And this is especially the case in Angola. But this is, again, because of different types of workers. Then workforces vary a lot between the sectors by origin, so the, these comparisons need to be uh, need to take these uh, aspects into account. I will come back to this issue of work-related accidents, but one striking finding was actually Chinese firms were generally doing better in terms of occupational hazards. So the, the frequency of reported accidents or injuries as a result of workplace uh, uh, accidents was lower or very similar in Chinese firms. For working hours, actually, we did find some differences, and they were not really that significant, especially in, uh, um, in Angola, a little bit more in, in Ethiopia, especially we looked at the, um, the manufacturing sector. And the other big difference we found was, especially for Angola, is much more likelihood of Chinese firms to offer accommodation and food. Okay? Obviously, this is related to the point that I made before of the preference for this dormitory labor regime, migrant labor regime, that was applied in the context of Angola, which means that you know, social wage may be higher in Chinese firms in Angola for certain categories of uh, workers. On training, there was, again, a very mixed picture. Uh, in Angola, we basically what we captured was formal type of training. Uh, and of course, what we find, because of the nature of the firms, the other non-Chinese firms in these sectors, which have uh, much more established systems of training, especially for induction processes by human resources departments. So that was captured partly by this evidence. But it was only through qualitative evidence that we captured the extent to which uh, Chinese firms, and of course all the firms also, engage in all sorts of informal mechanisms of training and skill development. This is actually the norm in many of these sectors, whether it's construction or manufacturing. But particularly, we found that it was in manufacturing where this kind of on-the-job training was critical for the kinds of skills that these uh, workers were uh, getting. So these are some of the descriptive differences. You see there, essentially, the confidence intervals. Uh, so where we're likely to find or confident of finding the average wages. So for certain categories of workers, indeed, you know, the uh, wages in Chinese firms tend to be on the, on the lower end. Uh, 
But as you can see from these figures, this is for Angola, also quite a lot of variation for each of these uh, different categories. Okay? And for Ethiopia, the same kind of pattern, some variation, two categories where the differences are more significant and two categories where they are not significant. Okay? So just by looking at these very simple statistical comparisons, quite a bit of variation, less variation across among Chinese firms, uh, but it's hard to conclude whether overall and by large there is any systematic and statistically significant difference in wages. So when you find these, obviously, in, and also, also considering the uh, different characteristics <coughs> of these different workforces across different types of firms, also different sectors, means that there may be many other factors that underpin some of this variation. Okay? And this is what we will try to show now, and Florian is going to take over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. So to, up to now, we've looked at essentially a descriptive analysis that is an analysis that doesn't take into account the confounding factors and the contributing factors that can help us explain the difference in wages that we see across different sectors, across different companies, um, and across different company origins in particular. So to go further and to look at what, uh, what is actually driving these differences, we conducted some more formal statistical analysis. In particular, we conducted some pretty standard OLS uh, wage regressions. Um, here we uh, ran regressions on the uh, log of monthly wages, and where regressions in this context allow us to do two things. In particular, they allow us to look at the partial effects of different variables, that is, excuse me, and how far the different variables contribute to the differences in wages that we observe. And in particular, they allow us to look at in how far the Chinese uh, origin or whether a company is Chinese plays an important role once we take other variables into account. So in our regressions, we control for individual level characteristics, such as age, gender, migration status, education, work experience, the socioeconomic status of the individual, a job tenure, that is the amount of time somebody has spent in the job, and of course, the skill level of the respondent. We uh, look at uh, firm level characteristics, in particular, of course, the company origin, but also the company size, and in Ethiopia, also whether or not the company is located in an industrial park, and I'll explain why that's important in a minute. And then, of course, we control for sector-level characteristics, that is the sector of operation of the company. Uh, in Angola, we also control for sample bias because, as Carlos has explained, the workforces we found in some of these companies were structurally different, and those structural differences were related to the timing of the surveys, which in part overlapped with an economic crisis in Angola that fo uh, followed the oil price crash, which meant that in some, some companies were operating uh, with essentially only their core labor forces, so with skeleton crews, while other companies were running their full labor forces and therefore had a much higher contingent of temporary workers in their sites. So what did the regressions tell us? If we look at Angola first, uh, we can see that a number of variables play an important role in explaining differences in wages. In particular, the biggest difference is whether workers are semi-skilled or not. As we already saw in the descriptive analysis, semi-skilled workers have a high wage premium. Uh, the tenure in the current job is important, as is previous uh, experience in the relevant sector, so in construction or in manufacturing. The firm size is important. Bigger firms tend to pay better. Um, but the most important variable really is the socioeconomic status of workers, and that again relates to the sampling issues that I've just explained. So core workers with longer experience uh, do tend to be able to command better wages, and so we did also add control variables to control for the sampling bias. What we found was in our preferred specifications, including all of these control variables and with appropriately clustered standard errors, we find that company origin is no longer a statistically significant predictor of wage differences. That is, what explains differences in wages are the characteristics of the labor force and the company, but not the national origin of the company. Similarly, in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, the most important variables that contribute to differences in wages were, again, a semi-skilled wage premium, uh, working in the construction rather than the manufacturing sector, as the semi-skilled construction labor force is the best paid in our sample. Uh, previous work experience in uh, the construction or manufacturing sector does help raise wages for workers. And in particular, once we take into account whether or not a company is located in an industrial park, we find here again that 
the national origin of the company is no longer a statistically significant predictor of wage differences. Now, why are um, industrial parks important? And in fact, we find a large uh, difference in wages paid to workers in industrial parks and wages paid to workers outside of industrial parks. <coughs> wages in industrial parks are 19% lower. Now, in part, that is due to simple locational effects, uh, whether or not you're close to Addis Ababa, where wages are obviously higher because living costs are higher. But uh, the more important effect has to do with global value chains. The companies that are present in Ethiopian industrial parks are the ones that are operating in the most sophisticated global production networks, ones that produce relatively high-quality goods for sale in the European and American markets. And companies that operate as suppliers in these global production networks are subject to cost pressures by the lead companies that organize these networks, that what you might call simple exporters, that export uh, lower quality goods to simpler markets are not subject to. And that is a big reason behind the lower wages in industrial parks, as is the particular nature of industrial parks as controlled spaces of wage setting and labor control, which I will come back to in a minute. But once again, to reiterate, taking all of these variables into account, the regression analysis shows that company origin, that is whether or not a company is Chinese or not, is no longer a statistically significant predictor of wage differences. Wage differences are driven by other characteristics. Sure, if it's a short one. It is. If you want to, in the in the Q and A, we can we can have a look at the at the actual output tables of the regression if you want to, and then we can we can go through variable by variable. Um, but if you don't mind, we'll keep it for then. Okay, great. Um, one one claim that is often made, in particular in the media, is that these wages are poverty wages. Um, now. That can have many meanings, but uh, the most common interpretation of poverty is to compare, uh, compare wages to international poverty lines. The World Bank uh, uses different poverty lines for low-income and middle-income countries, and these, world, uh, these poverty lines are expressed in so-called purchasing power parity international dollars. So to compare wages to international poverty lines uh, in purchasing power parity, we have to look at what the actual poverty lines are for low-income countries, a monthly poverty line is $58 in purchasing power parity terms per for, month. sorry, per month. Yeah. What did I say? No, no, just to. Okay, yeah, per to month. <laughs> <laughs> yes, per month. Um, in uh, in, uh, um, uh, in middle income countries, uh, they uh, adopt a higher poverty line, which is 96 international dollars in purchasing power parity terms. So uh, what we did is we converted the wages that we got in our, in our survey from local currency into purchasing power parity terms. And because these are relatively poor countries, when, if you convert wages into purchasing power parity terms, you get a much higher number than if you convert them at market rates into just US dollars. Yeah? So if you convert in purchasing power parity terms, which is what you have to do to be able to compare to poverty lines, we find that no workers in our sample earned wages that were below the poverty line, either for low-income countries or for middle-income countries. So in Ethiopia, in purchasing power parity terms, low-skilled manufacturing workers earned a minimum of $130. That in, at market rates, that's about $53. US dollars. Um, and low-skilled construction workers earned a minimum of $160, again in PPP terms. In Angola, uh, wages were higher in purchasing power parity terms, and low-skilled workers there earned about $300. The lowest paid workers we had in Angola, uh, temporary construction workers earned about $244 in purchasing power parity terms. So in terms of comparing these, the, these wages to international poverty lines, no, these are not poverty wages. However, international poverty lines are, I would say, uh, not the best measures of deprivation. And in particular, they are supposed to measure extreme poverty. So we don't think this is a good way of assessing whether or not people who are, lest we forget, in full-time employment are actually poor or not. So what we also did is we compared wages to living costs. And here we find that while wages are consistently above international poverty lines, people do struggle to make ends meet. So we collected a lot of detailed information on the real expenses that people have on a monthly level uh, and on the types of uh, food and commodities they own and they consume. What we found was in Ethiopia, for instance, 56% of our entire sample spent more than half of their monthly income on food, which is a very, very high rate of food expenditure. 
If you look at Ethiopian manufacturing, for instance, only 27% of low-skilled workers report that their wages were enough to cover their monthly expenditures, while amongst the better-paid semi-skilled workers, 41% of people uh, reported that their wages were enough to cover their monthly expenditures. So what this suggests is wages are above poverty lines, but these are certainly not living wages. Wages are still low. Carlos, would you like to say something about... Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in Angola, what you find is an interesting paradox, which is that the lowest paid workers, and that's probably because of the characteristics that I mentioned before, uh, were actually managing to save more money than those who were earning higher salaries. Uh, so when you compare the actual monthly expenditures to the wages, you see those categories, for especially for low-skilled uh, uh, workers in Angolan firms versus Chinese firms, you do see that the proportion of the expenditures, cash for monthly expenditures in those wages was much lower than the others. Of course, this has different types of interpretation. My point number one, uh, it is partly due to the dormitory labor regime. So uh, a lot of these workers, a large portion of these workers were not spending anything on accommodation and food, which uh, particularly in the Rwandan context are extremely high uh, expenses. Um, also, obviously, because they live in dormitories, they tend to have a much more frugal lifestyle than the other workers in you know, much uh, significantly higher wages working in factories in Rwanda. Um, so what you could see is that for especially uh, manufacturing workers in, in Angolan factories who were the, what, the best paid, they were the, one, the ones who didn't actually manage to save any money. But it is also true that they were more likely to have other sources of income to complement uh, these wages. So. Thanks, Carlos. So what can improve these wages? Following Eric Ollenwright and Beverly Silver, we can conceive of wages as being dependent on the associational power of workers on the one hand, that is, on the strength of workers' organizations, and on the other hand, on the structural power of workers, an important aspect of which is marketplace bargaining power, which is in part, again, driven by the scarcity of skills that people own. So we would expect skill development, the upskilling of the labor force on the one hand, and the strengthening of workers' own organizations on the other hand, and of collective bargaining processes to improve wages. So how did uh, Angola and Ethiopia fare in those terms? So if we look first at uh, training, we see that uh, there were relatively high rates of training provision uh, across, this, uh, uh, across some parts of the sample. Um, but we do see that, for instance, um, Chinese companies uh, provide less formal training. As Carlos has explained, this is in partly driven by the types of labor forces that were engaged at the time of the survey. While, for instance, in the manufacturing sector, we see that for, uh, especially Angolan uh, firms are very good at providing uh, training to their workers. This is only formalized training as well. So this doesn't capture all of the skill transfer that happens through um, learning by doing and other types of under-job training. This is just participation in formalized training programs. In Ethiopia, we looked at uh, all forms of training. And here we see that uh, the differences aren't driven, as they are in Angola, so much by the types of workers that work for companies of different origin, but they're very much driven by the sector in which companies work. So we see in the construction sector, rates of training are very low, hovering around 20%, while in the manufacturing sector, rates of training are uniformly very high across both skill levels and across all company origins. So there are very few differences in the Ethiopian manufacturing sector between Chinese, other foreign, and Ethiopian companies in terms of the training that they provide. So we have hopes that at least in the manufacturing sector, we will see upskilling as we go forward. Some of these international companies, especially some of the, uh, those operating in industrial parks, are very new enterprises. The first Ethiopian industrial park opened uh, only in 2012, and they're still coming on online uh, right now. I think the last one opened this year, last year. Jostin will correct me later if I'm wrong. Um, so there is still scope for improvement, we hope, in terms of the upskilling of the labor force. What about unionization and workplace conflicts? So in Ethiopia, for instance, we see that uh, unionization rates are low in manufacturing, 
but even lower in the construction sector where unions are almost entirely absent. In the construction sector, this is probably related to the difficulties in unionizing transient uh, labor forces in remote areas, which is where the low, lower skilled part of the labor force is being recruited, while high skilled workers in those labor forces do have a lot of marketplace bargaining power and consequently do command quite high wages. Um, if we look at manufacturing in Ethiopia, for instance, we see that the main difference is not between Chinese and other companies, but between all foreign firms and Ethiopian firms. And that difference, in turn, is largely driven by whether or not a company is present in an industrial park. Industrial parks are enclosed spaces, which, of course, makes it much easier for companies to resist the formation of uh, workplace unions. So uh, we see this very clearly in the statistics. So in Ethiopia, only 13% of workers working in industrial parks report having a workplace union, while outside of parks, 56% of workers do. The absence of formal workplace organization does not mean the absence of industrial conflicts. Strikes are incredibly common in Ethiopia and were almost universal in our sample of companies. Because of the limited nature of formal workplace organizing, these strikes tend to be wildcat in nature. So if we look in a little bit more detail at the distribution of, so these are, this is showing the percentage of workers who report having a trade union in their workplace in Ethiopia. As I just said, we see that the rates in the construction sector are extremely low. In the manufacturing sector amongst unskilled workers, which is the largest part of the sample, we see that there are few differences between Chinese and other foreign companies, but that both of those, so all foreign companies together, are very different to Ethiopian enterprises. Ethiopian enterprises are also much older, um, which uh, gives work, uh, unions a lot more time to establish themselves in these companies. As I said, quite a lot of the Chinese and other foreign companies haven't been operating in Ethiopia very, uh, for a very long time, and they are themselves acclimatizing, if you want to call it that, to the national legal context as well. Um, amongst the semi-skilled workers, the pattern is less clear. There are, there are uh, differences, and we see that clearly their uh, Chinese companies have the lowest rate of unionization. Um, Turning to uh, similar statistics for uh, Angola, here we have uh, data on reported strikes, which is the, the black bar, on the presence of collective bargaining and on the presence of a trade union at work. Um, we see that in other foreign and Angolan companies, actually more than half have implemented collective uh, bargaining procedures of some kind. Uh, whereas in Chinese companies, it's about 35%. And we also see again here a marked difference in the amount of trade unions that are uh, available at the workspace while we see, while we, see, yes, sorry, please. Just a little comment on, on this uh, as to give context. One of the reasons you might be uh, surprised by the other foreign Angolan companies having very high rates, the reality of this sector is that the rates on average are extremely low. So actually these other foreign and Angolan companies are very unrepresentative of these sectors. And what really happens is very simple. Trade unions in Angola are extremely weak and they can only manage to target the top leading companies in this sector. Uh, and that's what they've been doing for some time. So the reality of the unions, and this is what, what came out of the interviews with them, is that because these other foreign and Angolan firms have been in this market for quite a long time, so they've already you know, been present so for many, many years, and they've managed to incorporate the trade unions into these firms, even if it's not 100%, as you can see from, from, from the picture. Uh, but the Chinese firms, most of them arrived in around 2004 or 5, uh, and trade unions were basically unable to persuade these uh, Chinese firms to actually have uh, union presence. So that partly explains some of these differences. But generally, the overall rate of unionization in these sectors are typically lower than 10, 15 percent. Yeah, thank you. So. One of the main policy conclusions of our report is that um, if we are to see sustained increases in the wages and working conditions in these sectors, we really need to be pushing for greater unionization in workplaces and for labor market institutions such as sector level, excuse me, sector level bargaining and collective bargaining both in the company and ideally at the sector level. There are, of course, understandably, a lot of clashes uh, at the workplace. 
Um, the question is, are these clashes driven by cultural differences, or are these clashes driven by the standard antagonisms between capital and labor that you would expect to find in any workplace? Now, there is some evidence, uh, both from our survey and from the qualitative data, that cultural uh, work co issues of work culture in particular, but also language issues, do exacerbate some of the conflicts that we find. Communication becomes more difficult if there's barely a shared language, and a lack of appreciation of what is expected in terms of work culture or what is expected in terms of, uh, uh, of an employee do exacerbate some of the conflicts that we see. However, um, for instance, in uh, Ethiopia, we see um, that the difference is, again, really not between Chinese companies and other companies, but between all foreign companies as a group, so other foreign and Chinese companies, and Ethiopian companies, on the other hand. Once again, we think that is driven in part because, of course, communication is easier in Ethiopian companies that have entirely Ethiopian management, who, of course, all speak the relevant languages and therefore find it easy to communicate and also understand the local cultural context. But also, these companies, again, do not operate in the same markets. They do not operate in the same value chains as these international and Chinese companies do. And they are subject to much less pressures by international, um, by the lead companies that organize these uh, global production networks. And therefore, their management um, takes a, a much more lax approach to the organization of the labor process um, than companies that operate in these very low margin global production networks can afford to do if they want to maintain in profitable operation. And we do see paradoxical contrasts between the two different countries. So. In Ethiopia, there were large differences between uh, firms of different ownership types, again, driven by whether or not a company was foreign rather than driven by whether or not a company was Chinese. However, in Angola, we saw that company origin is not actually a good predictor of conflictual relations between managers and workers at all. And in fact, the overall rates of uh, reported abuse, harassment, and other types of conflict in Angola were much lower than in Ethiopia. Coming finally to the conclusions of our talk, um, before we conclude, I think it's fair to give you a couple of methodological caveats that uh, we feel you should be bearing in mind when interpreting the findings of our study. So uh, this is uh, us being honest about the inherent weaknesses that come with every type of a uh, research project. Um, in the company survey, but not the workers survey, the response rates for firms were uh, lower amongst non-Chinese companies, in particular in Angola, and that may affect some of the estimates of localization rates, because we have higher non-response rates in the, um, uh, uh, sorry, among the non-Chinese companies. In Angola, as both Carlos and I have explained, the sampling of workers in non-Chinese companies in particular was affected by an ongoing economic crisis which led to the predominance of a core, more permanent labor force in uh, construction sites. This was not the case in Chinese companies that tended to be operating with the full contingent of labor force that obviously included many more temporary workers than either Angolan or other foreign companies. In Ethiopia, it's important to bear in mind that, as I just said, the Ethiopian manufacturing sector is growing and is quite recent in origin in many parts. So some of the workers were sampled from newly established factories that had only been in operation for a brief <coughs> period of time. Uh, and this affected mainly the companies in industrial parks, which were exclusively Chinese and other foreign, whereas the Ethiopian companies in our sample had existed for much longer, in some cases 70 years, in the case of some of the oldest Ethiopian manufacturing firms. So please do bear these things in mind when you uh, hopefully go and read our detailed company reports and then also the synthesis report once it's out. What can we conclude from this research? Well, the first big conclusion, as I think Carlos made clear during the first part of the presentation, is that we need more research and we need better research. This is a highly polarized and evidence-scarce environment, and so we feel there is a need for careful, mixed-method research to engage with some of the predominant questions in this field. However, doing this type of research, in particular at scale and doing it comparatively, is extremely demanding, not least in terms of effort and resources, and that's why there's still too little of it. So our first plea is for more research to really comparatively look at these things at scale. Secondly, if we compare conditions for workers in Chinese firms uh, and non-Chinese firms, we find that overall the results are mixed. Um, 
once again, please bear in mind that what we looked at was not sector averages, but really the top performers in these sectors. Yeah? We really wanted to compare like with like. If we compare like with like in the way that we did, we find that there, it doesn't seem to be a clear pattern across countries, across sectors, and there are multiple confounding factors. So we really need to combine the macro context, the sectoral dynamics, and firm level attributes if we want to get a full explanation. So what matters? Workforce characteristics, as I think we've shown, the type of sector or market in which countries operate, in particular, for instance, global production networks, the country context, and specific micro-level local labor regime configurations, which, again, are partly determined by the network nature of production in contemporary capitalism, are much better explanations for working conditions than the national flag of the company. That was our presentation. We very much look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that was a tour de force. I'm sure that you would all agree that that was extremely stimulating and informative. We're going to have reactions from two discussants. Uh, leading off is going to be Linda Calabrese. She works for the Overseas Development Institute. She has a wealth of experience in East Africa in both the public and the private sectors, but also speaks fluent Mandarin. So she's very well placed to make the first set of discussant comments. Thank Carlos and Florian for the presentation. I think it was um, extremely interesting, very rich in detail, a lot of depth. I really, really um, want to praise the value of this work that you have done. As you said, a very long research project, very large scale, impressive number of results and findings that you have collected. Um, and there's a lot of value really in looking at the comparative uh, study and the way of, of comparative mm, uh, in here. Yeah. And thank Carlos and Florian for the presentation. I think it was um, extremely interesting, very rich in detail, a lot of depth. I really, really um, want to praise the value of this work that you have done. As you said, a very long research project, very large scale, impressive number of results and findings that you have collected. Um, and there's a lot of value really in looking at the comparative uh, study and the way of, of comparative mm, uh, analysis in the way you have done. And most of all, there's a lot of uh, empirical evidence that the rest of researchers can now draw from rather than relying on sort of smaller scale studies. So really, I think there's a lot of interesting points here. Um, personally, one thing that I also found very useful is how well you separated the, um, the sort of the infrastructure and, and manufacturing side, showing really the differences between these two sectors and also showing that when we talk about infrastructure, companies very often don't talk about contractors. I think there's a lot of confusion very often when people talk about Chinese investment, but not understanding the sort of uh, where, does the where does the finance come from and what you explained is these are really companies undertaking uh, services and operations in these countries, which I, uh, which I think is really, really useful. Um, I have a few reflections uh, based, on, based on what you just presented. Um, the first one is, is really interesting that um, your focus on, on localization base. I think this is definitely something that's very highly debated in the literature in, around China Africa issues. And one thing that always strikes me with this is, of course, this is really important, but the job creation itself is also extremely important. If you think about countries like, um, if you think about uh, countries in Africa, especially the East African ones where I work, they really have very high job creation targets that they set for themselves. So a country like Rwanda, for example, they want to create 200,000 new jobs, uh, off-farm jobs every year, right? And that's huge. So regardless of whether, you know, these Chinese companies or other companies employ 60 or 90 percent of, of domestic workers, still the job creation uh, effects are really, really good um, and, and very important for these countries. But the high localization traits that you find them, that you find to be very similar among Chinese and other foreign and, and domestic companies, these I think are very, uh, are sort of natural in a way, right? Because they make business sense. Companies think about what makes business sense for them. And hiring and, and employing 
foreign workers for which you have to pay accommodation, for which you have to pay extra salaries and work permits and so on, may not always make business sense. So really I feel like, at least in my experience and in my research, it, some, it, it always sounds like companies bring these foreign workers only when they have to, only when they have no other resources, only when they are told that they need to finish this project or complete this goal within the next six months and therefore they really need workers who can hit the ground running and immediately start working on the, on the time. Um, one thing that I should also mention is that um, I work with a number of projects funded by the DCDSRC Growth Research Programme. Um, and it's very interesting to find that some of your conclusions are actually in line and converge with some of these other projects. So specifically one project uh, by the China Africa Research Institute on skills transfer, technology transfer um, uh, by Chinese firms um, operating in Africa also finds that there is a lot of training provided and a lot of sort of skills transfer provided by the Chinese companies in ways that, as you say, may not always be the formal uh, training activities, the sort of classroom type training. Um, but there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of uh, learning on the job, learning by doing, studying, and so on and so forth. So I think this result is, uh, these results are very much in line. Another research project under this um, uh, uh, sort of um, funding stream is one that's conducted by the International Institute for Environment and Development, and they look at Chinese investment in um, natural resources in, in African countries. And one of the very interesting things that they found comparing Chinese and other foreign companies in African settings is that the most striking differences are not between Chinese companies and everyone else. The most striking differences are between the new entrants in the market and the older companies. So the older, more established companies, such as, for example, in the mining sector, the South Africans or, or from other countries, behave uh, in a different way compared to the new entrants, which may be, in this case, the Chinese very often, but also the Indian companies that have just started operating in the sector. So I think this is sort of an interesting comparative perspective. Um, getting back to your work and to your conclusions, I think your study is extremely interesting and any, as any good research project answers a million questions and raises <laughs> another million questions, which I now have. Uh, so I'm not sure whether some of these you may be able to answer based on your data and based on information that you have and some of these will require another four year research project or maybe another two or three. Um, I think it's very interesting when you describe the labor market segmentation, when you describe how Chinese companies in the Angola setting specifically seem to hire uh, younger um, migrant workers, for example. And I was wondering um, if you found any sort of reason or explanation for that. Is there any um, network of workers, for example, that, um, you know, call each other and if I'm hired by this company then I call one of my friends and my relatives in, in my village or um, or is there any other way through which this sort of segmentation is um, continuously perpetuated. Um, and another one that I find very interesting especially because I find it so counterintuitive actually is the issue around lower pays in the in the industrial part, lower wages in the industrial part. And you mentioned for example, that one of the issues is uh, around these companies being embedded in global value chains and global production networks. And if I think about it, that is very counterintuitive to me. If I think about a company um, that supplies H&M or, or GAP or Zara, these are companies that really need to answer to their stakeholders and that really pay a lot of attention to the consumers in European and US markets. So why does this not emerge? Is this because there's no set minimum wage that they need to answer to or what is the reason? I think, yeah, I think this is very, very sort of counterintuitive based on my knowledge in, in other settings. One thing this is linked to, for example, is, um, um, is also around the subcontracting issue. So when a company works in a, a supplying a global production network, Normally, there's a lot of control over what this company does, but when there's a surge or when there's an order that this company cannot fulfill, a lot of the work is very often sort of subcontracted to other companies. And that's when you lose sight of what are the working conditions in these other companies. Uh, but the one that's normally the first year subcontracted, you would, you would find a sort of generally better uh, wages and working conditions. So I wonder if you have any ideas about that. 
Um, one thing I had a question on is around telenovel as well, which I think at least in the work I've done in um, in um, in the manufacturing sector in South East Asia, there is a lot of telenovel. This is something that companies fight with every day, um, but they don't seem to have a clear answer for. So they say, you know, my work is always linked. I cannot say like they don't. They never stay for more than a month, but then no one really has an answer or a solution on how to deal with this. Uh, and in general, I think uh, with the premise that my work really focuses on, uh, on, on firms and companies more than on labor uh, and labor markets, uh, I think it would be very interesting to understand a bit more again about these companies. Are they exporters? Do they, to which markets do they export? Um, do they subcontract their work to other companies? And uh, who are their suppliers? Who are their, uh, who are their, uh, their contractors? These may be, again, things that we don't really have information on, but I think it's very interesting to, uh, to find out. One other thing that I also really uh, found very interesting is around the, the dormitory regime for, for some workers. Um, one thing that I think we can think about is how this changes the real wage of workers, right? So if you are provided accommodation and you're provided meals, it means you're, as a worker, actually, your real wage remains high. So even if your nominal wage um, doesn't increase, in fact, if you're given the services, your real wage is higher. And there are multiple benefits to this, of course, maintaining the sort of salaries competitive to companies that want to invest in these countries, but also creating jobs, because building these dormitories, are, it's something that's done by the construction companies in the country. So again, like there's sort of multiple positive effects um, to this. Um, and one <coughs> final point that I wanted to raise is, um, <coughs> sorry, because I'm ODI, because I'm, so I work on policy issues a lot. Um, and I think, like, the interesting part for me is, what are the implications for the policy makers for this? So you say that localization rates are actually very similar, and wages are also taking, uh, taking all factors into account, wages are also very similar among different across different types of companies, which I think is great and shows the value of, uh, you know, sort of having foreign investment as a catalytic force for development or for economic development, at least. One thing that um, I think a lot of governments are starting to ask about is, okay, we, we've got this foreign direct investment at the moment, so they increase our, the jobs that we have in the country, they increase our exports, that's fantastic. But how do we make it so that a larger part of the value stays in the country? So how do we build more linkages, first of all, with the comp domestic companies that exist, but also how do we maintain more of the activities, more of the decision-making, and more of the value in our country? And I think this is one where one needs to sort of think carefully about the value of sort of foreign investment versus domestic investment as well. Um, and so, of course, like, the value of foreign investment is also on the sort of skills transfer and tech transfer in some cases and so on. But it's also interesting, I think, to think about um, how can you use them to build more and more of the linkages with your local economy so that the, the development sort of is more um, sustainable in the longer term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Linda. We're going to have comment from uh, our second discussant, uh, who's Irene Yuan Sun. Uh, who's with the Center for Global Development. Uh, she comes to us via uh, multiple graduations from Harvard, uh, but from McKinsey's in particular, uh, where she was the lead uh, person who compiled the major database on Chinese firms operating in Africa. And her own book on the subject of Chinese investment in Africa was highly praised by the Financial Times as one of the great business books of the year of his publication. So we await your words. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. And um, first and foremost, I just need to congratulate the whole team for truly a tremendous accomplishment. Um, uh, having uh, 
been in your shoes, at least somewhat, uh, running large-scale surveys about Chinese firms, and you guys even went beyond that and did other firms, national firms, and so forth, um, this stuff is tremendously hard. I mean, I, I know what you guys have been through, being yelled at people, being under the sun, um, having timelines that just blow up in your face, having cost pressures, having difficult logistics. I mean, you guys have, uh, you know, really gone to the ends of the earth to get us this data. And so congratulations on this tremendous accomplishment. We in the field, um, and I hope in African countries, everybody in global development um, genuinely appreciates the, the effort that has gone into this. Um, I particularly appreciate this study and the way that it was uh, intelligently designed because it really filled a a really key gap in the field um, that you know I and others have been responsible for for a long time, which is that we keep talking about Chinese firms, and we respond to media reports about you know all this crazy stuff like prison labor, and so we go and look at the Chinese firms, and we don't do so in a way that is comparable to the other firms <laughs> that are also operating, and so. Uh, after the, the McKinsey report, where we interviewed more than a thousand Chinese companies operating across sub Sub Saharan Africa, you know, we had, we had all these statistics about Chinese companies. And some of the smarter observers would ask us, okay, but what's the comparable statistics for African companies or for Western companies? And we're like, we don't know. <laughs> we didn't get that. Um, and of course, there's only so much that any particular study can do, but you really filled this critical gap, which is that now, for the first time, we can really compare across different kinds of firms operating in the same market, operating in the same industries. Um, and the other critical gap is that we have now worker perspectives and statistically reliable worker perspectives, um, which is, again, one of these biases that's always been present in the field. You know, you go and you just bang on the door so hard just to get an hour of the manager's time. That already is a very, very difficult thing to do uh, to gain that trust. But you went way above and beyond that and gained the trust enough to then go, you know, disrupt production for a day while <laughs> you went and interviewed a statistically uh, representative sample of their workers. And so you fill these two really critical gaps in, in the literature. I have a couple of reflections um, that sort of go beyond the, the very careful findings that you just presented. Um, and then uh, I have a couple of suggestions for future directions. So the reflections... Um, and I'll put these a little more sharply than uh, perhaps your careful uh, wording um, and, and analysis will uh, be entirely comfortable with. But um, my first reflection is that this work, to me, supports the notion that really there is very little that's exceptional about Chinese firms or the nationality of any firms. Right, and so if I had it my way, we would just talk about firms according to industry, according to the environment that they uh, are working in, including the country environment and the dynamics there, the global value chains, or the domestic or local, local markets that they're serving. Right, It's clear that these are the explanatory factors that determine firms' behaviors, the way they treat workers, the, the wages that they pay, their labor relations, uh, their productivity. Um, and there's very little sort of, you know, this whole China, is it a Chinese firm? That's pretty much a red herring at this point, right? And so I think uh, policymakers, the media, um, even uh, workers themselves, right? And the workers themselves probably know this better, better than anybody, right? It's more about the skills that that you have, the, the industry that's available for you to work in, um, and the competitiveness of your country, right? That's the stuff we should all be talking about and trying to improve, uh, rather than, you know, do I attract uh, firms from this nationality or not, right? Like, instead, we should be like, okay, where? what's the sector that you should be attracting, right? What's the kind of, the scale of industry you should be attracting? Oh, and then find the countries where, where those investors exist. Um, the second reflection 
is a bit related, which is that I think for too long this this whole area has been talked about in terms of uh, as if it were static. And in fact, uh, if you, you know, one common thread that runs across all of the, uh, many of the descriptions that you've had is that this is incredibly dynamic, right? You see this in the fact that localization rates for the workforce uh, actually are hugely dependent on how long the company has been in that market. Um, you see that uh, companies are, you know, thinking about evolving their wage regimes uh, in response to retention issues. Uh, you see them, uh, there's other um, sort of anecdotes uh, and qualitative things in the literature that shows that, you know, Chinese firms overseas, for example, get more comfortable with things like trade unions um, if they've been operating for longer. Uh, and for other firms as well, right? Like what non-African firm wouldn't be the first to say that they learned a lot and changed a bunch of their practices after being in Africa for a long time, right? And so I think we have to really think about this as a dynamic process, and again, stop the impulse to essentialize uh, firms as they are in these snapshots and realize that you know it's an evolving market uh, and, and people change and firms change over time. Now, the couple of future directions that I want to suggest, um, I think one is that, uh, and probably the most important one is I think this study serves, should serve as a huge wake-up call to African policymakers in particular. There is so much important content and uh, policy recommendation linkages in this. this. This work is incredibly rich with suggestions for future policy directions. A, a couple that come to mind immediately um, is uh, Number one, in terms of uh, worker welfare, particularly the the fact that there's no minimum wage in Ethiopia, uh, the you know th that has got to be a huge, huge area of translation of these findings that workers are spending more than fifty percent of their wages on food. Uh, that you know things like dormitories that that leads immediately to a potential policy option that could be costed out. Uh, in terms of the minimum wage, you know, having some sort of anchor wage where if you look at the business models of firms, you know, and what profits they're making, could you set a minimum wage that still allows them to be profitable and competitive, but ensures that workers are not spending, you know, 50 percent of their of their wages on food? So I think that's one clear area where some, you know, some targeted work could really translate into some really effective policy making. Um, another one is this whole area of training, right? The fact that, you know, the foreign investors in a country, um, in some of these countries, are dismissive of the, and don't care about the educational qualifications that a worker comes from, right? That that is a non-factor is just, that should make, I think, everybody stop and pause and reflect on how to improve education so that it's genuinely uh, useful for, for things like job creation and employment, right? And of course, that's not the only value of education. I would be the last person to say that we should be educated just to find a job. But in these markets in particular, being able to have a livelihood on the back of the, the education that you've gotten, I think, is, should be a policy goal. Um, and so this this notion of training, um, I, I very much liked uh, Linda's point about uh, the the increasing attention to the notion of um, non formal training. Um, you know, in in a lot of professions, uh, that is how people get good at their jobs. And so, some way to study that, to emphasize that, to uh, to encourage that in in policy making, I think would be very warranted. And then my other uh, suggested future direction, um, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're working on um, managerial level employment um, as a follow on to this work. Um, I think it, it, in general, there, if there could be a clearer sort of, even if it were descriptive or conceptual linkage to business model, 
Right, and I think your industrial park uh, data point is, is a really suggestive illustration of this, right? That business model may be one of the biggest determining factors driving a lot of the, the, uh, the outcomes that we see. And so can we get deeper on, on what is the impact of business model on, uh, on these outcomes? And so, you know, is it whether the firms are primarily serving domestic uh, market in their countries or versus exporting? Is it the niche versus mass market product type that's that's really driving things? Is it uh, the contract versus, um, you know, uh, ongoing investment divide? Um, is it, you know, the margin of the products? You know, at, at my clients at McKinsey, there is a, you felt it as a consultant, there is a big difference between being at a a high margin consumer packaged goods client versus a low margin retailer, right? The whole workplace culture was different. And so, you know, can we pick up a few of these major dimensions and even just start hypothesizing and data gathering or looking at your existing data and, and looking at some of these connections? And then how can we get some of the rapid indicators? Because I come back to, again, my congratulations to you for, uh, for, this huge seminal accomplishment. And I think also realize that you all need vacations. You all need to take a break, you know, and we can't kind of be in a world where it takes four years of this giant team to get two countries worth of data, you know, and then like this is a heroic Herculean accomplishment, right? So is there some way that we can, we can imagine having more rapid indicators, maybe more, you know, light touch things that policymakers themselves or multilateral institutions, international organizations can do just to keep up you know, almost like a pulse survey on some of these things so that we can make sure that the impact is being created, the policymaking direction is being guided by closer to real-time data and doesn't take, you know, the, <laughs> the, the heroic, you know, it doesn't take heroism in order to, uh, to see some of these, uh, these pieces of progress actually being made in the future. So thank you for having me and congratulations again. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost out of time. We've probably got just enough, however, for one or two questions from the floor if people have got some burning questions. Well, I think that not everyone can stay here until 6. But let's start with a couple of questions. Uh, yes, up here. In the I'm going to take a bracket of three questions. The gentleman at the back there. Yes, uh, I'm the first speaker. I think Dr. Oya mentioned the uh, stereotypes. You have to speak up, please. Uh, 
Okay. And gentleman here. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, the Xi Jinping is um, economic strategy mentioned in his one of his speeches to develop mental community systems. Um, with how does this compare to uh, China and Africa? China's work in Africa compared to the Belt and Road Initiative. <laughs> is there anything in that? Is that enough for you to make a first Maybe response? Uh, okay. Uh. <coughs> well, thanks very much, both of you. I'm um, great um, projects and lots of interesting um, findings. Um, a couple of things that we didn't mention, and there are other reasons why you weren't able to bring them out. But one is um, the question of what, I mean, you talk about ownership in terms of nationality, but of what about ownership in terms of state ownership versus mm. private? companies and whether you're able to, to look at those uh, at all. Um, another issue is that sometimes there's argument that there tends to be more casualization in um, Chinese companies or not as the case might be. But again, I think that's another and obviously the problem that you were saying in the case of Angola about looking at that because of the timing and yeah. so on. But, yeah. but again, it would be interesting to know whether there were any um, significant differences. Um, and I wonder about the, I'm slightly confused about industrial parks and special economic zones. I mean, because in China or in other free trade zones in other parts of the world, we think of them as being for the export markets. Mm. But several of the ones in Africa seem to be more for the domestic market. So I wonder, I mean, you seem to be saying that in Ethiopia, the industrial parks were integrated into the local production networks. But it, you know, and I know some of the big Chinese firms operating in Ethiopia are exporting, but are there also firms in these industrial parks producing to the Ethiopian market? And can, can that be separated out? And I suppose, well, the, um, it's kind of picking up on um, um, Sun's comment. Um, well, while I agree with you that one needs to get away from this kind of methodological nationalism, that attributes everything to national origins, I wonder whether you're actually prepared to throw out the baby with the bathwater yeah. yeah. and say that actually <laughs> all these firms are exactly the same wherever they come from. Which, um, you know, it seems to me that there may still be um, some elements of, uh, but you do need in to take into account differences between firms from different origins. Not just Chinese, of course, yeah. but other places as well. Okay. Uh, Carlos, yeah. uh, Florian. Okay, let me just uh, start with the. With, with, thank you very much for uh, your reflections and, and especially the, um, the future directions. Um, and, and of course, we really appreciate that um, you seem to like the, what you've seen so far. <laughs> we didn't waste three, four years of our time. Um, <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, I mean, let me let me start from the um, the question. I think has come up uh, in, in two or three instances of of the lab of dormitory labor regime. I mean, this is a term that has been used in the Chinese context, so that's why we used it. I mean, you can start from the notion of a migrant labor regime first, and then the dormitory part is an element, an aspect of it, which is not necessarily applied in all contexts. So there are reasons in the Angolan context why, uh, and indeed we did enough quality research to probe with Chinese managers, for example, you know, what was uh, underpinning these, these, these sort of uh, choices. Um, so there is a narrative from Chinese management which sort of makes sense. It doesn't mean that, you know, that kind of discourse really reflects the facts. Um, the, what's really interesting is um, so a number of Chinese firms, this is especially uh, in construction, but also in, in, in factories in Luanda, uh, partly because of their very limited experience in the, in the market uh, and problems they faced in the early days with precisely labor turnover. Um, another common complaint, uh, um, and again, as you can imagine, you've talked to managers, they also tend to es essentialize culture. Um, so they, they uh, um, 
they created, in a way, in their minds, these stereotypes of extremely unreliable Luanda workers uh, because of absenteeism, lateness, uh, always with excuses, having you know five, six different fathers and mothers, and all the rest. Um, and that sort of you know stereotypes, we you know, because it's part of the manager's perceptions. Um, was affecting in, in a way the, the business, and the business model was based on you know this uh, uh, this time pressures, uh, completing projects. Actually, that is one element which we need to take into account. Chinese firms are treated differently in the Angolan market, in construction market, compared to other firms, and this is something that we are exploring with a little bit further research. So they were subject to different kinds of pressures. Uh, so for them, the obvious solution was to try to exert more labor control by basically housing the labor force uh, and trying to make sure that it wasn't, and it wasn't just a question of, oh, let's pay lower wages as a result, uh, because, you know, we do, we do find other companies that do not apply this kind of regime, uh, paying, you know, higher wages, you know, they, they, they opt for a different solution. But what is interesting in the Angolan context is that they also uh, um, borrowed a common stereotype in Angola that workers from certain parts of the country, i.e. from the center south, Wambo, Lubango, etc., are highly disciplined, hardworking, reliable workers. They borrow this perception, they, they sort of package it in a, in, a, in a way that a, almost every manager was repeating the same thing. Uh, so they, don't, they didn't just create a la dormitory labor regime, they also selected the workers from certain parts of Angola because they thought these guys are far more reliable. They're less likely to leave. They're less likely to go back to the villages and visit the families and never come back. Um, and anyway, so there's a long story to this. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but there, there is a, a, um, a long history of, of you know, uh, the colonial forced labor system in Angola, which particularly affected people from, from these areas, uh, the legacies of the war, which particularly affected people from these areas, both MPLA and, and UNITA, the two warring parties, were uh, dominated in their, you know, in the rank and file by people, soldiers originated from these areas and so on. So there's plenty of evidence that suggests that, you know, a lot of this labor force segmentation has very strong, deep-rooted historical roots. And what many of these Chinese firms basically did was exploiting these, these historical legacies to build their own uh, more reliable labor force, and in a way that paid off. And, 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 and it's true that companies uh, um, uh, using that, that system certainly, uh, um, according to what they report, they managed to really uh, address issues of labor, high labor turnover, as well as um, improve their productivity in, in, in many ways. So that's probably you know, the sort of background story to this. Now, the complication is that, so then, might we expect then Chinese firms to you know, export these dormitory labor regimes everywhere? Obviously not, because we didn't find it in Ethiopia. There was no one instance of this in Ethiopia. So then the question is, why not in Ethiopia? Well, partly because these kinds of stereotypes were not in place, point number one. So there was no... Uh, uh, structural reasons to think that there were some preferred labor force pools in Ethiopia that you know companies could tap on tap in in order to to improve their the their reliability of the labor force. But also, quite importantly, what we know from our qualitative research is actually the Ethiopian government is very uh, reluctant to uh, uh, encourage or even allow companies to go down the route of dormitory labor regimes because they do associate these with systems of labor control they don't like. So part of the reason is also an implicit discouragement from the Ethiopian government. And if there's one thing that we, you can certainly conclude from this and other research, particularly for Chinese state companies, going to back to the, your point, is that they do listen to the governments. They do take the government seriously. So they will adapt whatever they do, the business models, the labor regimes, and so on, to whatever circumstances of, of each context, and particularly to their relations with the government, because their business model, of course, are capitalist enterprises, but if that's not, they're not just capitalist enterprises, they have other goals. I mean, this is, I mean, if there's one lesson from Chin Kwan Lee's work on Zambia, it's precisely that varieties of capital matter, so state-owned enterprises do have uh, logics that are not the same as the others, so that they will pay attention to that, which is, uh, in a way, the implication of that, uh, and going back to your point on policy implications, is that 
clearly there's a lot of scope for poly African policymakers to uh, to exploit these these potential leverage. That uh, a lot of what the working conditions, I mean, that would be one of our conclusions as well. A lot of what the working variation in working conditions that we find have to do with what African policymakers decide and do. Uh, we show that with the localization rates, a significant factor underpinning these differences between an Angola and Ethiopia is very different attitudes of these governments uh, uh, towards questions of labor. Um, in the Angolan context, again, if you want to go back and also, okay, we found that localization rates were not as low as we expected, but okay, they're still much lower than Ethiopia. So why? But one explanation of this is very simply that in the early days, especially the, the first uh, five, ten years, the Angolan government was primarily interested in building and rebuilding things, ports, uh, roads, etc., at high speed and delivering on the brick. They were not so interested in labor. And it's actually quite difficult to find any instance on any even discourse where there is a significant uh, mention of you know, labor or hiring Angolan workers, etc., or working conditions in any of these. Areas. So that, that also makes a, a big difference. So because that wasn't a priority, Chinese firms, again, we know from the research we, we did, and even when we were doing research, this was quite visible. You just needed to visit the project sites. Chinese firms were subject to far more pressure in terms of completion rates, speed, etc., than the top Angolan and uh, other transnational firms in the same sectors. Particularly, the Angolan firms seem to have, be working in a, in a different segment, not really competing with the Chinese firms. Mm -hmm. So they, they were working in, in, in parallel worlds. So that, obviously, that kind of dynamic, market dynamics, has an impact mm -hmm. on these labor regimes, recruitment, decisions about whether to. Uh, um, so if you think about Chinese firms at that time, subject to these pressures, et cetera, say, well, I mean, these guys don't really care about you know, whether we employ 80 or 70 percent of the labor. They're actually asking us to finish these in 18 months. We can only do this if we bring a number of carpenters, et cetera, from China. Otherwise, there's no way uh, uh, we can achieve this. So from that, I mean, one of we have actually a brief. It is in Portuguese still, but we will uh, put it in English. One of our uh, policy recommendations in the Angolan context is precisely that large-scale infrastructure projects of the kinds that we visited uh, should have labor criteria in their, uh, in their contracts and so on, which would mean a revision of the standards for completion, I mean, completion rates in terms of time frame, but also what they expect to pay, OK? So budget, I mean, the financial proposals, but also the times of these proposals will have to be adapted to criteria about two things. First, increasing the localization rates, so if you want to hire more Angolan workers, but secondly, encouraging or, or, or sort of incentivizing uh, the systematic training of these workers, not just the one-off training, but systematic training of these workers uh, leading to higher labor retention and so on. This can only happen if a project that they would normally complete within 18 months is given 24 or even 36 months. Okay? So that is something that the Angolan government should be able, should be prepared to accept in order to improve uh, uh, working conditions. Um, so I'll leave the question on, on, on the industrial parks to Florian. Uh, if you know, I mean, I, I have some views, but clearly the, uh, um, you can blame the companies and global production networks, but I think, you know, I think Irene has mentioned this. Not having a national or sector level minimum wage has been a major issue in, in Ethiopia. Okay, to the point that I mean, when you ask, you know, how wages were set in certain spaces like certain industrial parks, which were considered flagship and so on, then you start getting some answers. Actually, the, the, the initial levels at which wages were set were far too low in relation to the ecosystem that workers were going to find around these industrial parks. That was the other part. I mean, we haven't talked about this, but there are certain industrial parks in Ethiopia where everything was done at high speed. Uh, I mean, if you visit one of some of these parks, the conditions are great. It's certainly not sweatshops. The big problem is what surrounds these parks. And what surrounds these parks is towns that simply did not have the basic conditions to uh, house, to attract a very significant migrant labor force. There are some parks in which managers didn't know 
that the labor force was coming from 50 to 100 kilometers distance because they thought that there was enough labor pool within that area to be employed in the park. And again, we could talk uh, at length, but this was also related to the fact that industrial parks and the way they've been uh, set up and managed, and especially the labor recruitment systems, have important political dynamics uh, associated. Okay, where the parks are, are sited and how labor is recruited and from where. So that is, you know, part of the uh, uh, issue. Um, so why perceptions? Um, why these perceptions? I mean, I think there are two reasons. Uh, one is the lack of evidence, obviously. And second, I'm afraid to say there has been a very strong anti-Chinese bias in a lot of media reporting on these issues from the early days. Uh, and, and that was reflected not only in terms of how some of these stories were circulated, but also how they were recycled. Um, we, we suffer from these as well. I mean, um, well, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, our first experience of media reporting in Ethiopia right after the workshop last week was atrocious, was appalling, to the point that the, the reporter basically said exactly the opposite that we said in the workshop. So whether that is incompetence, just incompetence, or a combination of incompetence and some kind of unconscious bias, that's, that's for you to sort of reflect. But that, that's pretty much, I think, uh, um, for a reason. Uh, to, just to raise this point on, on, yes, of course, SOEs, we look at that, and, and we take Ching Kwan Lee's work on, on these varieties of capital seriously. The only problem, one of the main problems we have is that, is the sector bias, that, you know, there's an per almost perfect correlation between state-owned enterprises and the sector. So, you know, 100% of all the companies in the road building were state-owned, and then, but we still, we could still manage in terms of, from the qualitative research, to see to corroborate some of the findings from Ching Kwan Lee's in terms of some of these rationales not being uh, um, uniform uh, across. So varieties of state versus private capital, and even within uh, uh, the private sector, private Chinese firms, there's also a lot of variation depending on the particular sectors, if they're exporters or not. True, in some of industrial parks, some of the companies were work, uh, uh, producing for the domestic market and many were also exporting, so there are differences uh, as well. And also, if Chinese firms, private firms, come from different origins. You know, we're always doing research on this. And that also matters, the origins within China, and the networks of firms and sectors that we, within which they operate also uh, affect their business models and therefore their, the labor regime. So the, these issues are, are in, in our... So I would say that on the methodological nationalism, I mean, we tried, we, we had to respond to this question. I mean, these were a basic research question, so we had to distinguish Chinese versus others and so on. So we, we are guilty of this methodological nationalism. It was partly also to, to engage with this debate. Of course, uh, uh, if you take these varieties of capital seriously, there will be elements of, of the origin that matter. Uh, but it's impossible from that to, to infer that national origin is a major determinant. Our conclusion is basically that it is not. But once you, as you increase the level of granular, granularity, you look more in-depth in within certain sectors, yes, you will find differences. For example, obviously, the dormitory labor regime is far less likely to be found in an Angolan or in, in you know, Brazilian or a Portuguese company in Angola. You know, they just don't have that kind of uh, habit of, of managing or controlling the labor force. Just to follow on from that, uh, I think it's um, important uh, what I, um, uh, Irene said, that these, these are dynamic situations. They change over time. So even where you observe um, origins by nationality, the question is, do these persist over time? Um, one thing where you quite, uh, and it's important to remember that if you imagine, you know, who are the foreigners who come to countries like Ethiopia, like uh, Angola, to to run construction sites, to run uh, production facilities there? These are people with technical training. They are they are production managers. They are they are good at uh, at uh, organizing workforces, at uh, organizing production sites. They often have extremely limited knowledge of the circumstances or culture in which they're going to be operating 
before they actually arrive. And it's a learning process for them as well. So um, in some of the qualitative work we've done, you did see, for instance, with uh, companies that had uh, not been in the country for very long, their views, for instance, about um, the role and utility of trade unions were very much colored by um, the role that trade unions play in their own political, in the political economies of their own countries. And it then takes them a while to understand that what they find in Ethiopia or in Angola might be a very different situation. And that just because something has the label trade union, it doesn't operate in the same way that they are used to from their own national context. And then you do see adaptation over time. So I think the, the dynamism over time is an important aspect here. Um, Going back, to the, going back to the industrial parks, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll say something about industrial parks and about turnover at the same time. So why did we find lower wages in industrial parks? So like I said, part of the effect is a locational effect. So in part, if you, a lot of the companies that were outside of uh, industrial parks were in Addis Ababa. Um, where living costs are, of course, the highest in all of Ethiopia. And so you'd expect that, uh, you know, of course, people's reservation wages are much higher. Generally, companies can't afford to pay such low wages. Rents and these kind of things are much higher in other suburbs. So in part, we're capturing a little bit of a locational effect there. But we, 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 uh, we ran various different specifications, and it's not driven by the locational effect. So it really is driven by um, the fact that companies in um, these uh, industrial parks have a different business model, as you were saying. Um, and that is driven by their participation in sophisticated global production networks. It is absolutely true that um, we would expect these companies to be paying more. You know, they, they, uh, they uh, especially in, uh, in textiles and in leather products, the lead companies in these production networks are customer-facing companies. Um, uh, you have business human rights and all these kind of things that mean that, you know, these companies uh, should, be, um, should be facing much greater scrutiny of whether and how they comply with certain minimum standards. So the first thing to say is that, as Carlos just said, these are incredibly modern production facilities that have modern safety systems and these kind of things. So these industrial parks, the, 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 the physical conditions in these factories are much better than physical conditions in older factories, simply because the factories are modern and they were built to a modern standard. Yeah? They, are, they, are, they are well lit, they are uh, well ventilated, and they have uh, things like sprinkler systems and fire safety systems. Yeah? So we're not talking about sweatshops in any in any way, shape, or form here. And then I think the, what came out quite strongly in the in the qualitative work was that w companies don't really care about the wage level per se; they care about unit labor costs, right? A lot of these companies are quite new, so they were still in the process of. I mean, they had set up their production, but they were really still in the process of learning how to run a company effectively within these new national contexts that they didn't necessarily know an awful lot about before they actually arrived there. So what we heard again and again in our management interviews was, yes, at the moment productivity is very low. We do expect productivity to get much higher. You know, so some companies might have been at something like 20% of the productivity that you could expect uh, to have in China, but they were expecting to get to 70 or 80 over a period of two or three years' time. And what they all said was, look, wages aren't the most important factor here. So we heard several times people say to us, you know, we could double wages tomorrow. That's not the problem. The problem is if I double wages tomorrow, I have to double them again next year, and I can't afford to do that. So they were taking a strategic approach to, to setting wages. Um, whereby they were unwilling to set wages far in, adha in advance of increases in productivity in case they don't reach the productivity levels that they were projecting, yeah? all with a view to maintaining unit labor costs. However, as Carla said, their initial pegs for setting wages were much too low. And we know that not just because we looked at, uh, at people's living costs and compared it to that. So, I mean, to give you a concrete example, uh, an Ethiopian, uh, Ethiopian manufacturing workers, after their living costs were subtracted, were able to save, on average, 0.8% of their monthly salary. So, I mean, that's living hand to mouth, basically, right? The, I think the best indicator for the fact that wages were set too low is that people voted with their feet. So a lot of these companies came. So what is the, what is the predominant narrative about Ethiopia? It it's has a huge population, over 100 million now by the latest estimates. Um, it's one of the poorest countries in the world. So if you're an international firm, you would expect that you know, people would be running your doors in as soon as you opened the factory gates. What we actually found was at the time of where we were conducting research, the, 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 the most flagship industrial parks in, in Ethiopia, housing the best companies, were having recruitment issues. <laughs> 
They couldn't get enough workers to come and apply for the jobs that, uh, that they wanted to hire because word had gotten out that you, it's difficult to live off the wages that these companies were offering. And as Carlos has already said, that's not simply a question of the absolute wage level that these companies were offering, but also a question of the lack of support infrastructure and urban ecosystems, if you want to call them that, um, that surround these parks, which meant that, for instance, living costs for workers were much higher than had been originally projected both by government and by companies. You know, if you factor into that the limited representation of workers in decision-making processes through low rates of unionization and uh, uh, very low rates of collective bargaining arrangements, then there wasn't really a mechanism for correcting these things immediately in the short term. What we've seen more recently is that what you see now in these industrial parks is that there is a huge spread developing in terms of wages. So you see spreads of about a third between the highest and lowest paying company wages is what we found in our, in our follow-up research and in recent qualitative work. And the best performing companies or in terms of pay, so the companies that pay the highest, um, they've actually managed to, to stop the turnover issue from becoming an important uh, predicament for them because turnover is bad for their productivity. You, know, you train workers, they, they, they uh, start working for you. If they leave after three months, you have to train a new worker. And that person doesn't know anything about your production line, so you know your productivity will, uh, will never rise. So these companies basically realize, look, if we, want to, if we want to get to the productivity levels that we're imagining, then we have to raise wages now to allow people to have a secure livelihood and then that way we can retain them here in the in, in, in our labor forces but you do also see people who essentially free ride on this better reputation that other that some of the international companies have established mm -hmm. for being relatively high wage employers by going to sort of the, the the low road to profitability within a sector that internationally is already known for essentially being the low road to profitability yeah, so I, I think that's probably what explains what explains our findings with uh, with, with respect to that. Um, differences in in terms of uh, in terms of uh, labor control. What you what you see is quite interesting. So what's happening in Ethiopia at the moment is that a lot of it is a lot of the the. Um, confusion about where wages should be sitting is partly related to the fact that there isn't a minimum wage in Ethiopia. Legislation is just being passed that will, for the first time, set up a wage-setting council. And, and that is supposed to be a tripartite mechanism that will then set and update a, a minimum wage. However, a, a minimum wage in and of itself is, uh, doesn't do anything unless you set it at an appropriate level. And if you set the minimum wage too low, then it's uh, not going to be uh, it's not going to be useful. So we're hoping that minimum wages will be set at sectoral level, because if you set a minimum wage for the national economy of Ethiopia, where many people are extremely poor, then it's not simply not going to impact workers who work in in these kind of modern production environments, because the national minimum wage would have to be set quite low, basically. But the other thing, that the other aspect of this legislation, um, which clearly shows the impact of uh, concerted employer lobbying, is that it's going to become possible to lay off people much more quickly for infringements of workplace discipline. So I, I think it's something like a kind of four strikes and you're out system for being late at work. I think if you're if you're on the fifth day that you that you if you if you miss five days in a six month period, then you can be fired without compensation. So these kind of mechanisms are now being put into the Ethiopian labor law. Um, as part of, uh, because basically employers have uh, uh, at least have the perception that their mechanisms that they've tried, that they know from other contexts of labor control, have actually failed, and they haven't quite figured out how to adapt to the national context of Ethiopia and the cultural context of Ethiopia to find labor control mechanisms that actually work. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to suggest that we continue the discussion informally at the reception. We're going to have a reception. Where is it, Carlos? Yeah, so we're going to, um, what's it called, the Paul Webley wing um, under the glass roof. And we're going to have, I mean, another important member of the team is our artist, David Escalenge, who we deployed to our field sites to take high quality photographs. Uh, so you will see an exhibition of a uh, selection of these uh, photographs in the uh, Senate House building uh, with uh, some catering offered. I think, is it the catering there? No, the not yet. The catering is not there yet. The okay. exhibition is ready. The exhibition is ready. <laughs> when I left. So the, the, the exhibition is ready, though. So maybe another five, ten minutes, okay. I guess, the catering to be there. Should well, we maybe continue, continue outside of KLT and then we can all go together? Yes, yeah, we can all go together to the, to okay. the exhibition area. Why do we do that? But 
adopt before we convene outside and go together as a unit uh, to the exhibition uh, arena. I think that as chairman, I should once again thank everybody, Linda and Irene and Florian and Carlos. It is a gargantuan work that you two have undertaken. Um, four more years, four more years. <laughs> I mean, um, hard labor for the rest of your lives, I think. But look, I think we should join together and congratulate them in the time-honored fashion. Thank you.